Thank you for joining. Uh, this should be kind of an interesting uh, webinar. Um, the uh, the movie The Intern is, is something that I, that when I had seen it a few times uh, being advertised, uh, I, I kept saying to myself, well, oh, I'm not sure if this is for me. And then uh, I had uh, an opportunity of taking a flight somewhere, and I had seen other movies, and I decided, let me watch this. And uh, I became kind of hooked on this movie. And I've watched it several times, and each time I watch it, I come up with some new ideas and better understandings and uh, start to you know look for ways of making adjustments so that I could uh, you know work with other people more effectively especially uh, the uh, the newer and younger people that are coming into the work environment so uh, I found a lot of useful things here there's actually so much that you can learn from it we certainly can't cover all of it in the next hour but um, I am going to provide you with uh, some items that I found that are interesting, some lessons learned, and uh, then I'm going to ask you for some input. I'd like to hear from you about your uh, observations about the movie, what you got out of it. I've talked to several people who um, are, uh, I don't know if they're experts, but they spend a lot of time talking about millennials and the relationships with uh, uh, different generations and so on. And uh, they found that the, the movie was an excellent source of information and uh, very accurate in the way uh, people uh, work together when they're, we're in a multi-generational type of environment. So before we get started, which will be in about three minutes from now, I see that there's a couple of questions. And I, I like to make these webinars as, as open as I can. And um, whenever possible, I'm going to try to... Uh, engage you by opening up your microphone if you have a comment or uh, state a question or make a chat or something like that because I'd really like to get your insight uh, about this movie. I see that I've got uh, somebody from India, someone from the mountains in California, Roger and Linda from Florida. I know Florida's been having tough weather down there. You went from severe drought and, and lots and lots of fires and I didn't think I, recently I think you were involved in uh, a lot of areas are involved in flooding, so uh, some tough times down there. Uh, hopefully all that is passed and uh, things are getting back to normal for you down there, which is hot and humid and rain uh, every day, but maybe uh, not so much that you've had recently. Anyway, I see uh, Renee Adair is on the line here. She's from uh, Austin, Texas. And uh, we've got about, uh, let's see, something like 24, 25 people uh, on the call right now. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself, say hello, make a comment, and uh, be prepared to to uh, participate. Your, what were your observations about this movie? I, I like I said, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I've watched it uh, several times, and, and I still like to watch it. And I still kind of take notes when I'm uh, watching the movie because they really this combination of Anne Hathaway and Robert De Niro is. It's pretty amazing. That's my good friend Kevin Martin from sunny San Antonio. I need to get back down there, Kevin. So let's let's talk about that. I'm 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 due for a visit to San Antonio. Uh, Charles is from Concord, California. How you doing, Charles? So I'm just curious. I, I just as before we get started, uh, how many of you have really seen the movie and and other than for entertainment purposes, learned a few things? Um, if you've learned a few things from it, if you made an observation, something that you think could be shared, uh, post that uh, during the session, and I might ask you for some additional comments about that. But uh, like I said, it was a very enjoyable movie, and I, I really had a good time watching it and uh, learning from it and was looking for a way to share some of that information with uh, other project managers. So, again, thank you very much for joining. I show 11... Let's see, what is this? About 11.59. It's almost time to start. So I think we'll get going on it. And uh, if you know anybody else that might be interested in joining, they can still join uh, while the, the session is in progress and the session is being recorded. And we'll post it for people to review uh, later on. Uh, so let's get started. Lessons learned from the intern. What new and experienced project managers can learn from the movie The Intern. And I'm Frank Salatis. A PMP, PMI Fellow, very proud of that title. I, I see that someone did post a question. Let me just check with that. Okay. 
Uh, Kevin says, uh, yes, he watched it twice and find the mentoring going from and, and two members of the team very timely and appropriate. Yeah, uh, mentoring, that, that's a good word I think we can use. Robert De Niro, in, in my opinion, did an, an excellent job of, of being a mentor in, in such a way that uh, that people basically uh, open them up, up open up themselves to to the, the character of Ben Whitaker. Uh, he was very respectful. He was polite. He was very consistent, um, and he certainly uh, did stand out in the organization of, of many 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 young people. But um, the way he did it, uh, the, the, his his approach, his mannerisms, the way he spoke to people, the the fact that he was very respectful. He did ask questions. He offered help. And I think that was an important thing. He actually offered help, even though that he was not very familiar with a lot of the technology that was surrounding him. Uh, he really was looking for ways to help people and to uh, learn from them also. And, and I think that uh, that's that's the message that came across to me loud and clear. Uh, Renee says, younger generation wanted to minimize the contribution they thought they would get out of the older interns. But then they were surprised and they ended up learning from each other. That's actually what this is all about. Uh, Yale says, I saw the movie. I like the way Robert used his EQ. I, I'm going to guess that that's emotional quotient to figure out what the boss wanted. He cleaned up the team table. He did the menial work. He didn't boast. Yeah, the cleaning up the table, that was something that was on um, Jules mind all the time. We got to get that fixed. Gotta, and all of a sudden it was gone. And he took care of it. He did a lot of things looking for ways to just contribute to the environment. So uh, these are really uh, important observations and, and we'll see more of those as we go on. So um, just a, a couple of things, just like any other webinar, we've got some objectives here. The objectives, identify how relationships between the, the different generations of managers and leaders and the seasoned leaders can create value and a new opportunity. Also provide suggestions for working in a multi-generation organization. And I'd be uh, uh, curious to hear your comments about how we can do that. Uh, today's uh, older generation, the baby boomers, are not necessarily retiring as quickly as, as a lot of people thought. They're, they are staying around, and certainly there are some, some different differences in values and things like that. So um, I'd be interested in your real life uh, suggestions about how we can improve that uh, environment in a multi-generation organization. And then, of course, the strategies for managing and leading across generations. So uh, the, the intern, to me, was sort of like a, um, a launching pad for ideas, and uh, it really helped people to, uh, at least it helped me, to really understand, uh, you know, how we should be approaching these uh, so-called generation gaps and things like that, uh, technology differences, the differences in the way we dress and things like that. And I think that these are really important things and we can come up with some strategies from your experiences that would really help with that. Um, ask uh, how many people are multitasking at this moment? Yeah, Roger, that's a, a good point. There are people, I'm sure, on your smartphone looking at email and trying to listen. Um, so that's really uh, kind of an interesting question. Maybe we should uh, focus on having a discussion amongst these people from around the world here on this call, on this webinar, and, and leave the, the social media stuff uh, on the table for just a little while. Uh, so Roger, thanks. Uh, and he says it's not just the millennials either. That's right, Roger. It's, it's probably everybody. So, uh, so let's let's try to uh, you know pay attention to each other and listen a little bit, and and maybe we'll come up with some some interesting ideas. Okay, um, just a kind of a thought to get things started. You know, Robert De Niro, 70 years old in the movie, uh, retired uh, manager from a, a a phone book publishing company. Uh, kind of lonely, looking for something to do, decides that uh, he's going to respond to the uh, advertisement uh, looking for uh, these uh, senior uh, interns. And it was kind of an interesting thing when they had that first discussion. He met with the person interviewing him. And the person interviewing him was obviously maybe, I don't know, 24, 25 years old, somewhere around that time. And uh, in the typical uh, way in which they conduct interviews, he, he asks Robert De Niro, so where do you see yourself in 10 years? 
And of course, uh, Robert De Niro says, you mean when I'm 80? Uh, in other words, let's be a little bit more sensitive to who we're speaking to and make sure that we are asking the appropriate types of questions. Uh, that question of certainly is, is something you might ask someone that's just out of college and going on to a career and, you know, asking about your vision. But I think that you might want to be a little bit more sensitive to someone that you're speaking to that's 70 years old. Uh, another thing. Um, another person that was interviewing him was talking about where did you go to school and things like that. And he said, you know, I, yeah, I graduated in a class of 65. And she says, what was your, your major? Do, re do you remember? So, you know, I, I think that we have to maybe just be a little bit more sensitive to the, when we're talking to people. You know, just because we're getting older doesn't mean that we don't have a memory. And uh, let's focus on the things that, that people can bring to an organization and, and not so much, you know, their appearance and their age and how they dress and things like that. So uh, I, I think that uh, just to get started, those of you that are the 20-somethings, the millennials, and, and even uh, Generation X and so on, um, you know, let's, let's try to find ways to look for the positives when we're working with people as opposed to look, identifying very specifically what all the differences are. Uh, I think that that's an important thing for us to, to keep in mind. Um, I think I missed a slide here. Let me back up here. No, okay. All right, so the first lesson learned, and this comes from, from Ben Whitaker, and this is when, when he was realizing, you know, there's got to be more to life than, you know, just getting up in the morning and, and going to do that exercise in the park. Um, he didn't feel like he had purpose, and so he really said, you know, I've got to get going. I've got to do something, and uh, his suggestion was keep moving and keep doing, regardless of your age. You know, look at the opportunities to create value. There are things that you can do for yourself, for your friends and your family, and for your company. Um, uh, many years ago, uh, well, I, I worked for AT&T for 28 and a half years, and there was a time, uh, you know, when I was working in an operations office, and, and things were really, really busy and difficult, and each day was just a challenge to get through. We were in customer service and handling problems with customers and things like that, and it was a, uh, a, a tough situation, lots of uh, un unhappy people calling, and, uh, you know, the, the dialogue was, was not always positive and things like that. And I remember saying to my boss, boy, I just, I wish I could retire, you know, and I was, you know, in my late 20s at the time. And uh, my, he said to me, you know, Frank, you got to do something. You, you really don't want to wish your life away like that. Uh, you know, a lot of people wake up in the morning and say, oh, it's Monday. I wish it was Friday. Some people say, oh, I can't wait till I retire. Well, you know, I think that uh, if you have that kind of an attitude, then you're going to miss out on a lot of things. We have to look at each day um, what the opportunities are that we can to add value in anything and in, in everything that we do, how we treat people every single day. And I'm not just talking about in the, uh, in the work environment. I'm talking about at home. I'm talking about with friends and just people on the street. You know, you look, look for opportunities out there to, to create value, even if it's a momentary value where you're helping someone just for a minute. Uh, you have created value for yourself. You've done something that's going to make you feel good, and you're going to reflect on that for quite a while. And you know what? You might actually get that person to do something nice to someone else. You, you kind of create a chain reaction. Your uh, friends and family. Okay, We probably spend more time on our jobs, at least my generation did. We spent a lot of time on our job and not enough with the family. And uh, I, I truly, truly would like to change that if I could. Of course, I can't. But, uh, you know, what I tell people when I'm speaking in, in sessions and presentations and so on is that uh, the time you can't get back. And when you have children especially, and they're going through their different age, uh, you know, classes in school, the grades, they're doing certain things, you got to find time to do that. Work is not going to disappear if you, if you don't show up one day so that you can attend your, your son or daughter's graduation or, or some kind of a recital or something like that. Uh, there were times that I missed that I, I truly regret to this day. So, so find ways to, to focus on your friends and family and do things that are going to make them feel good too. And of course your company. Ask yourself, you know, what am I doing each day that's creating value for my company because, you know, 
we are all ambassadors of our companies that we should be looking at ways to create value not only for ourselves but for our, our customers and for the organization uh, itself. So that was the first of uh, several lessons learned. The uh, second one, number two, and I've got actually ten to, to go through here, okay, and I'm just going to go over these and I'm going to ask for some comments, but um, the first one, attempting to do everything without assistance Okay, back up on that. Uh, from your Stanford team sends a message about the worth of your team. So think about that. Jules, uh, as, the, as the current CEO, was very, very engrossed in doing things and really wanted to do a lot of things on her own. He didn't really want any help. And when the intern actually showed up, when Robert Dino showed up, she had forgotten that she had actually agreed to that particular program. And she simply said to him, you know, uh, if I need something, I'll, I'll send you an email. And it was a very, very brief discussion. So if you are in a uh, leadership position, as a leader, your behavior, your work ethic, and how you treat people will absolutely establish the foundation for your company's culture. Uh, take the time, first of all, you know, you're not going to be able to do everything yourself. And people actually appreciate the fact that you're trusting them by giving them certain things to do, even things that are extremely important to do. So you have to kind of practice that a little bit. And uh, there was a scene where, this, this really struck me, there was a scene where Jules visited a warehouse because they were, they were getting some com complaints about the condition in which their clothing was being shipped. So she actually went to the warehouse and she walked over to the employees and she spent time and you can see her from the distance and Ben Whitaker is watching her and she is opening up a box and she's showing people how to carefully fold the garments and closing it up and she didn't do it in a condescending way, she did it with a smile, with care, where she was truly concerned about what was going into the package and also how the customer was going to feel when they actually opened it. And the people just gathered around her and they all smiled and then she, she thanked them all and, and kind of went, went on back to her business. But um, the thing here is that when you really truly care about the things that you do, about your company, you're going to take the time and you want people to understand what your value system is like and, and to take a few extra minutes and make sure that it's done right so that we, we have a delighted customers and not people that are going to complain when uh, they send their, their comments and their uh, products back. So uh, with that, before I go on to the next slide, uh, any observations, any comments, any uh, thoughts from your perspective on this uh, item here, leaders do need help? Or the other one that was just prior to that, which was we got to keep moving. Any comments? I'm, I'm here to listen and share your thoughts. Anything at all? Some comments that uh, uh, we could add to this discussion. Okay, I'm not seeing any comments right now, so I'm going to move on. How about this one? Okay, I, I see something coming up now. Let's take a look. Okay. Uh, I think of set the example, Charles uh, Cannon, and the other point was that her admin could do the analysis on the sales. That's true. Okay, um, and, and we're going to get to that a little bit later on also, a little bit about that analysis uh, that uh, Ben had identified a little bit later on in the movie. Millennials are often not good listeners. Interesting. Uh, millennials, if you're out there and, uh, you know, comment on that. But um, my personal experience is that uh, anytime I'm, I'm speaking to someone in that particular age group, uh, very often they are uh, somewhat engaged uh, in texting, looking at something on the smartphone, or doing uh, multiple other things, looking around the room. And you know, some basic uh, listening skills might be something to, to consider. But uh, let's let's hear from from the, the other side there in terms of. Um, in, in terms of uh, you, you know the other generations and how uh, you you perceive them, okay. Um, speaking and listening are devalued to electronic communication. Yes, that is a. Uh, I have actually have a, a little comment about that a little bit later on regarding uh, technology. So um, let's talk about this. Ring the bell. Okay, how many of you remember what they did? Uh, when somebody did something good in the movie, someone did something outstanding, uh, the bell was rung. 
when something good happens, make sure that everyone knows about it. I, I think this is really, really good advice, and I think that uh, we, we may not actually follow through on that as much as we, we should. Somebody does something good, celebrate it. Celebrate a victory. Hey, a win. It was a great win. Look what somebody did. It, it made things easier for us. And uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent of sincere acknowledgement. And what I, what I mean by that is if someone does something really good and it's worth your comment, simply, don't simply say, good job. Tell them why it was a good job. You know, give, give 30 seconds of, of thoughtful explanation because people are going to feel so much better about the fact that you actually did pay attention to what it was that they did. Okay, I, I learned that lesson kind of interesting way way back in 2004 when uh, I was uh, graduating from the PMI uh, Leadership Institute master's class and after the commencement speech by the professor Jerry Brightman, I, I went up to him and I shook his hand and I said, good job. And I tried to release my hand and he wouldn't let go of my hand. And you know, my initial thought was, what, what's going on here? And he wouldn't let go of my hand. He said, why? And I said, why what? He goes, why was it a good job? And, and my, I was thinking, um, I just gave you a compliment, and you're, you're giving me a hard time. And he said, I want to know why, why you thought it was a good job. And then I said, well, you know, you covered some interesting things. I learned a, a new principle. I, I thought that you uh, were, were very sincere about things. I just gave him a bunch of information. Then he let go and he said, thank you. And I'll never forget that. If you're going to give an acknowledgement to someone, then take the time to make it a sincere acknowledgement. You know, I've got some comments up here. Uh, lack of listening skills is a universal challenge for all generations. Each have their own unique distractions, not unique to millennials. That's John Watson, a good friend of mine down there in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, yes, definitely, John. Uh, the point here is that all of us can do a far, far better job of uh, listening. Uh, speaking uh, and listening are devalued to electronic communications. It's important to involve the team. It builds trust. That's Yale from New York City. And celebrate the moment. Yeah, if something happens, take a moment and, and truly celebrate. I think that that's really important for all of us. So, you know, I think all of us are starting to see that there are lots of things that we can do differently. Here's another one. Engage everyone. Many leaders of organizations, especially, and this is my personal experience, not-for-profits and organizations that rely on volunteers seem to pile lots of work on a few people these few people that are willing to do a lot but you know what happens is I think people begin to uh, take advantage of that few and the many are, are going about their business but not doing anything near what this this handful of people does so what we really need to do is instead of giving all the work to a few people in the movie Jules just dumped uh, everything she could possibly think of on her secretary uh, and, and there were not that many people involved in, in, in many of the major business things going on. So it's our job to actually get everyone engaged. Now, that in itself is a challenge. And, you know, to me that has an awful lot to do with uh, leadership capability. How do you get people engaged? Now, whether you're not-for-profit or for-profit, business, private, uh, or um, a government, what we need to do is find ways to engage everyone. And I'd be curious as to those of you that are on this call, what, they, uh, what you would do, uh, what you are doing to get everyone engaged and make everyone feel a part of your organization, that they really want the organization to succeed, and that they really truly want to participate in engaging in value creation. So if you have any thoughts, comments, suggestions, um, I will give you uh, one thing that I learned uh, a little bit, or at least an observation. Uh, I mentioned Kevin Martin, who is the uh, past president of the PMI uh, San Antonio chapter. And um, I had been to several of their meetings over the past couple of years. And the thing that, that, that struck me the most was the level of enthusiasm and excitement amongst the chapter's leaders. 
you could feel it that this was something that they really liked to do. They enjoyed doing it, and they made it clear to everyone what a great thing it is to be part of the organization and to volunteer. And they did this through their their tone and their body language and and the things that they talked about. Uh, it was upbeat all the time, you know. And even when there are problems, you know, you can still stay upbeat to some extent. But but I have to say that it's your personal enthusiasm that is going to to uh, to drive the business or your organization. And the one thing about the intern that I uh, I did pick up was Jules was totally, totally dedicated to the organization. What she needed was a little bit of direction. Uh, Charles Kennan says, I have been creating job aid to aid the individuals. This spread the knowledge allows for more to contribute. Yeah, definitely. You want to get out there and, um, <clears throat> you know, get, first of all, get people involved by telling them what is going on. Keep people, people informed and create these aids to help them get their job done and, and also uh, make it make yourself available to assist. It's, it's really important stuff to do that. So yeah, uh, get everyone engaged and, and again I'd, I'd really like to hear more about you know how you engage people to, to get them to be very enthusiastic about your organization. Okay, now um, I, I stuck this slide in here. I had to use this slide earlier uh, in a different session on emotional intelligence and um, I thought it was appropriate to just take a look at it real quick. But what you have here is a, a collection of things, behaviors that you probably do, some of you do every day. And you have to ask yourself, what percent of time are you doing these things? And then what's your ideal percent of time? Now, this, this is probably not a complete list. If you, if you have some suggestions on what else could be added to this list, uh, certainly share them, but um, the behaviors are informing, directing, clarifying, persuading, collaborating, and so on. Now, if you are spending enormous amounts of time informing, that might actually be a good deal, but uh, it would also indicate that if you're spending 60, 70 percent of your time informing, is there maybe some issue regarding communication? If you are spending most of your time directing, uh, the question you might ask is, why do I have to keep give, telling people what to do and direct people? Is there something about their job assignments that's not clear? You know, what's going on here that needs attention? If you're clarifying, again, getting back to communication, if you're spending most of your time clarifying, then there's there's got to be something that may be cause, causing some confusion. If you're persuading uh, a lot of the time, are you... Ha did you really clearly state your vision and your mission and your objectives and uh, you know you're selling what it is that you want to do are you passionate about that these kinds of things uh, if you're brainstorming and envisioning that to me sounds like you you're engaging an entire organization you're looking for new ideas you are kinda of focused on the future and being creative maybe a little bit of your time should be spent reflecting um, I, I understand that most CEOs do spend a certain amount of time each day, even it may not be very much, 20, 25 minutes, where they are given some quiet time, or they ask for quiet time to, to uh, kind of uh, reduce the stress, relax a little bit, reflect, and, and allow their thoughts to come together, which is a great time to be creative. Uh, are you observing, or if you're disciplining, okay, if you're observing, I think that's great. We spend a lot of time observing so we can learn. If we're disciplining a lot, if we're spending a large percentage of our time disciplining, then we're going to have to start looking into the root causes here. You know, why are we spending so much time doing that? Same thing with resolving interpersonal conflict. And maybe we're probably not spending enough time praising and recognizing and, and simply saying thank you. So let's see. Uh, I think we've got a comment here I'd like to, to address. So let me go to the uh, question box for a second. Wow. Okay. John Watson, a lot of stuff there, John. Uh, can we get a copy of the presentation, Jennifer? It's going to be posted. Um, Yale is asking, what is a job aid? And, and a job aid basically is a description of what people have to do. Maybe it's a template. Maybe it's a step-by-step -step process. Maybe it's information to make sure that people are clear about what it is that they do. Job aids are like tools like I said, templates or something that is going to help a person make their job uh, easier to do. Okay, do not be judgmental or prejudge others by perceived stereotypes. 
be open to people's knowledge, perspective, and experience, and be open to the possibilities. Great quote from the 94-year-old who is currently leading a team of engineers and researchers at the University of Texas that are developing a new, longer-lasting battery. I'm old enough to know you can't close your mind to new ideas. Uh, Dr. John Goodenow. So uh, really good stuff there. John, thank you very much. Appreciate that. John, Dr. John Goodenow. Okay, outstanding. So anyway, think about your time that you were spending with these certain behaviors. And if there's another behavior that should be listed here, then please post that. be kind of helpful for us to, you know, I'm always learning from other people, so if, if there's a uh, another item that you can add to that, make it more complete, please uh, please share. Remember uh, some of you from your PMP studies or your teamwork study, the forming, storming, norming, performing, uh, Tuckman model, uh, we probably have to go through that sometimes fairly often, but, uh, you know, l learn lessons from the forming and the storming and how you get to be a performing organization where, where value is being created every day and people absolutely enjoy uh, working with each other to get things done. Now, um, <clears throat> this next one, disagree when necessary. Kind of an interesting thing. Sometimes leaders actually think that they know everything, and this can result in severe reduction in creative thinking. So I, I, I'm sure that all of you have experienced the manager, leader, who simply has all the answers, doesn't really need your input. Uh, even if they ask for your input, they've already decided what they were going to do before they asked you. And, you know, that creates a situation where you're going to have a severe creativity shortage. And you know what? You might have people that sooner or later will decide, you know, I have to go someplace else where I can get my thoughts actually hurt. So uh, let's, let's focus on uh, giving people an opportunity to share their knowledge. It's, it's, I think it's virtually impossible for someone to actually believe that they know everything. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've experienced that in the past where people came up to me and said, I know, Frank, you're new in this position. Uh, you know what? Listen, I know all the answers. Just do what I do and you're going to be fine because I know how to do these things. And you know what? What does that make you feel like? Does that make you feel like a, a valued individual? Uh, just kind of uh, do what I do and you'll be okay. I think people want to express themselves and be more creative. Let's see. We have a comment here. Uh, Dr. Good... Oh. <laughs> okay. The way you spelled it is a good note. Dr. Good enough. All right. Um, anyway. As far as knowing everything, I'm sure that there are people out there that are working with people who think they know everything. And, you know, let's uh, start to stand up for ourselves, you know, take a moment and disagree. You know, say, wait a minute, uh, you know, I understand that, but I, I respectfully disagree with your opinion. I think there's a better way, and here it is. But you know what? In order to do that, you're going to have to know your stuff. Speak up, present it, but you have to speak with extreme confidence, extreme confidence, you know, so know your stuff before you actually disagree with someone because if it's an opinion, then it's just an opinion. But if it's based on fact and research and knowledge and things that you can actually uh, back your, your statements up with, now you've got something going. So make sure that you know your stuff. Okay. Um, what if your leader isn't open to ideas? Um, well, you know, Carol, that's a, a really good question. There are lots of leaders who are not open to ideas. However, and, and this is going to sound a little strange, and I just mentioned this. I was at a um, session two, uh, Thursday evening. The PMI New York City chapter organized an outreach session with a women's venture group. You know, these were a lot of women with getting into startup business and, and things like that. And um, one of the people in the session said, you know, I've got a person who really I'm having an issue with. She, he, he, he doesn't want to cooperate with me. He, he gives me information that's, that's not useful. He leaves me out of discussions. Uh, and then if I have to do something, he's going to tell me exactly what it is I have to do, and he doesn't really honor any of my input at all. And what you have there is a know-it-all, not a think-they-know-it-all, but 
but this was in the construction business, and, and this person had been around a long time. And I have to tell you, people do learn a lot of things on the job over a long period of time. And this was a, your classic example of a baby boomer type, you know, working with, of all, you know, situations, a, a younger person that happened to be a woman. And there were some real issues with that. But my suggestion was that think, uh, rather know-it-alls, they, they do um, re actually deserve some respect for the things that they know. But it, it's best in many cases to, to not argue with them, but to actually kind of join forces with them and position that person more as a mentor. Now, there is a book that I, I think helps answer the question, you know, what if your leader isn't open to ideas? And that is, and it's a strange title, but I love this book. It's called Dealing with People You Can't Stand. Uh, the professors are uh, uh, Brinkman and I can't remember the other person, but uh, Kushner, Kushner, Kushner and Brinkman. And uh, they have a whole section on dealing with that, that kind of a person to give you some tactics to deal with it. But the bottom line is that you have to create an alliance with this individual by, by working um, from a mentor perspective. You get this person to, well, what do you think about this idea? You're, you've been an expert in this for a long time, and I was kind of toying with this new idea, and I was reading up on it, and I'd really like to get your perspective. So turn it around. And in many cases, you know, they begin to see things differently, they start to do their own research to get back to you because they see you are doing some research and coming up with new ideas. So I would suggest that you uh, maybe look into that particular book as a start. Okay, so but like I said before, make sure that you know your stuff and it's, it's critically important for you to do that before you actually uh, disagree with the uh, boss or the person next to you. Number six, this was a quote that Ben Whitaker used in the movie uh, when he was speaking to to Jules, <laughs> and he said, "You're never wrong to do the right thing." Uh, and uh, Jules said, "Did you say that?" And he said, uh, "Yes, I did." But then he said, "But I'm pretty sure that Mark Twain said it first. So you, we do have to do the right thing. My my comment on that is sometimes doing the right thing isn't easy. We have to." talk to someone, we have to give a critique to someone, we have to remove a person from a position. Whatever that uh, item is, it's the right thing to do, but that doesn't make it easy. And uh, leaders do have to make tough decisions occasionally. Now, in the situation with Jules in the movie, uh, their venture capitalists were putting pressure on their, their I guess, the, the I'm not going to call them senior executives, but the executives of the firm. And they felt that, uh, you know what, we need a CEO. And, uh, you know, they felt that they needed to get someone in there that had balance and some more control and a more worldly picture and this and that. And, uh, you know, Jules was kind of blindsided by that. But they, there was enough pressure there to make her realize that, you know, I may have to look into this. I may have to, you know, give up what I do to someone else and start taking orders and have a boss just so that uh, the, the, the company can do better. Now that's, I mean, that's the story behind this, that she wanted to go, that she was told basically, you need to go look for a CEO. And uh, she had a tough time with that, a very, very tough time. But she was thinking, at least in the early part of the movie, you know, this might be the right thing to do. It's, it's very difficult for me. This is my company. This is my baby as I started it up. And yet, you know, for the good of everybody, maybe I have to do that. So we are going to have to make tough decisions occasionally, but let's make sure that we understand the consequences of the decision, the benefits, the opportunities, but also the consequences associated with that decision. Okay, I've got a comment here, so let's see. Thanks, Frank. You are right about know your stuff. Absolutely, Carol. Thank you. Okay, so um, anyway, let's, let's move on. This is number six, and number seven is... There is value in establishing a multi-generational workforce. Now, uh, I picked this up from an article that I read, uh, and, and you know, I, I know that I, I identified very, very much with uh, Robert De Niro in the movie. I, I just uh, kept saying to myself, geez, you know, when I grow up, I would like to be like him. And it was because uh, of the way he, he talked to people. It wasn't about 
uh, age or gender or anything uh, like anything like that. What he wanted to do was simply find something that benefited him, gave him a feeling of self-worth, but also that he really truly wanted to help other people. And the one thing that he had throughout that entire movie, if you really notice it, was his ability to observe. He observed what was going on. He saw what people were doing. He saw the situation when the secretary was all upset because Jules decided that she needed some assistance and the, the secretary felt like she was a failure and she wasn't being appreciated and a number of different things. And the way Ben Whitaker handled it was, hey, try this. You know, we'll relieve we'll your stress. You know, let's work together. You know, let's see how, let's give it a chance. And, and just spoke from a position of dignity humanity and, and, and work habits that were really beneficial. There was nothing condescending about anything that he did. Uh, one of the things that I was kind of, it was actually kind of funny, was in the very beginning of the movie when he, when he got the job as the intern and he showed up to work with the attache case and he took out an alarm clock and a pad and you know a telephone and, and things like that and compared that to the young person sitting next to him that was bringing out all this new technology and I got kind of laughed at it a little bit, but it was so true, the, the, the clashes of the generation when it comes to the technology. But you know what? The movie allowed uh, that, that technology difference to be overcome by humanity, and I thought that was great. So combine wisdom, experience, and balance with energy, creativity, and technology. And what that means is that we take the older generation, okay, Robert De Niro as, as Ben Whitaker, where you know over years and years of managerial experience and he learned to work with people and he learned to, to, to show respect and things like that and he also um, picked up a lot of things along the way you know doing the life's road and what we have here is the energy creativity and technology of these younger people that are coming in that they they want to work they, they have high energy uh, the environment is different uh, you know it's, it's much more um, social in the environment of, of today as the movie depicts than it was many, many years ago. So this combination of wisdom from the older generation, the baby boomers and so on, and the energy and the creativity and technology brought in by the by the younger folks, the millennials, and, and like I don't want to leave out the Gen X people. I was told to be very sensitive to the fact that in many cases the Gen X folks are skipped and we don't want to do that. You know, there's the, there's the baby boomers and then the baby boomers had kids and, and then the kids had kids and so on and then we have all these generations and we want to make sure that we look at um, the contributions of all of these generations. Now uh, the next one, re-engage. Okay, and I picked this one up also from a couple of different articles but balance social media with actual discussion and dialogue and thoughtful conversation. Maybe less texting and the use of those uh, emoticons or what those things are. Um, you know, when we're having a discussion with someone, maybe it's time to not text. And maybe it's time to, if you there was a situation where uh, one of the people in the movie uh, did something that was not very nice uh, in regards to his girlfriend, and uh, he tried to make it up by, by sending her a text message with all these, you know, hearts and kisses and things like that. And uh, Ben, of course, is saying, you know, how about try talking to her? So let's do that. Maybe a little bit more talking a little less texting every once in a while uh, so that we can bridge those those communication gaps that, that sometimes exist. Okay, I'd be curious about your comments on, on that, the re-engaging, the, the texting, and you know, how do we overcome that? Anybody have any suggestions on that? Uh, texting is here to stay and the use of electronics is certainly here to stay and it gets more, more engaged, well, well actually more and more, uh, I don't know if it's not complicated, but uh, there's just so many more options that are, for, are, that are available with technology and it keeps changing. But, you know, how do we maintain some connection via actual conversation? I'd be uh, interested in your, your comments on that. Okay, get some sleep. This is also something that was brought up multiple times. you got to rest up a little bit. You know, uh, years ago, I know that I, I worked on maybe four or five hours of sleep. I'd, I'd go into the office at 7 a.m. and be coming home 9, 10 o'clock at night. Uh, didn't get a chance to see my kids. They'd already be in bed. Um, your sharpness will certainly be affected when you are not getting enough rest. So you got to take a break. You can't work 24-7. You can't work 60, 70, 80 hours a weekend. And if you're in an organization where the people demand that, 
then uh, you need to start to speak up about that and, and, and maybe uh, look for ways to change that or uh, maybe it's time to, to find an organization that's going to pay more attention to your personal health uh, and balance that with the, with, the, with, the, with the work of the organization. So definitely uh, get some sleep, regenerate. You will definitely, absolutely strengthen your immune system and if you don't, you know, you wind up with cold all the time or you're going to get sick and of course that affects your productivity and, and just your outlook on life also. So get, get some kind of a regular sleep schedule uh, going. I think it's, it's truly important. That was mentioned by, by Ben in the movie several times. Um, let's see, 50% uh, of communication is nonverbal. Get over it. Well, you know, Roger, yeah, there is a lot of nonverbal communication, but I think that what we have to do is make sure that we balance our communication. You're absolutely right about nonverbal communication, but we use email and we use texting and we use messages and so on. You know, a little bit of personal contact is important. So uh, let's kind of balance that communication. I, I, th I think you're right, but uh, my personal opinion is uh, nothing beats a phone call once in a while. Okay, there's an awful lot can be accomplished in one phone call than 20 emails or texts. Um, Carol says it's here to stay, but we do need to take the time to speak with people face to face and over the phone. It's like taking time to smell the roses, absolutely. Uh, I find, Kevin Martin says, I find technical or higher introverts are more prone to text than talk. Agile practices promote face-to-face -face as much as possible, given the richer nature of body language. Yeah, t Kevin, that's a good point to bring up. Um, and maybe that's an area for crossover into the traditional project management uh, realm, that Agile requires people to talk to each other fairly often, and, and also, especially during those stand-up meetings and things like that. So, so Kevin, I think that uh, uh, you're, you're touching on a very, very important point. Okay, uh, so let's uh, let's continue to focus a little bit more on that. I really think that uh, that's a, that's an excellent point. Uh, I also get three emails on the same subject. Uh, I shift to a call. Nonverbal communication tends to lack a tone. Yeah, tone is very, very important, especially in the, the uh, email and then to somewhat in texting and so on. Uh, Emily, Emily, how are you, Emily? Nonverbal communication tends to lack a tone. A person's mood can steer a text email nonverbal in a wrong direction. You're absolutely right, Emily. I think that's an, another important point to make. And Charles says, sometimes emails and texting, so times picking up the phone and talking or Skyping or actually doing the face-to-face -face in person uh, is really a good idea. Yes, Charles. Yeah, let's let's do that every once in a while. Let's let's talk. You know, I think a phone call can save you 10 to 20 emails. That's my uh, uh, unscientific estimate, but that's a, a key thing. And thank you for all these comments. Get some sleep. Absolutely. Let's make sure we do that. And then uh, number 10, the last one, build friendships. Now this I picked up from uh, a an article. Uh, entitled Five Lessons De Niro's Intern Can Teach You and uh, it says a meta-analysis of 148 research studies show people with stronger social relationships had a 50 percent increased likelihood of living longer. Okay, well I'm for that. I, I want to build friendships. I want to find ways to learn from people, to, to enjoy their company, uh, to have some fun every once in a while. I think that we can't work every single day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We, we need to have some fun. We need to uh, be able to sit down and talk to people. Um, there are several people on this call, this webinar, that I am have learned to be friends with from just being part of PMI, and those relationships are absolutely invaluable. Uh, and I, I absolutely, truly appreciate those friendships, and I like to keep building on them. And even if we don't see each other for two, three months at a time, um, the, the, the connection doesn't go away because we're always somehow connected, whether it's a quick email, a, a, a LinkedIn, something posted on Facebook, or just simply a hello that's being sent out. Um, these are the kinds of things that are important. And you know, every once in a while, picking up the phone and calling, just say hello, might shock a few people. But you know what? It's going to build your relationship. And uh, Mohammed says, I think sleep is the super healer for all problems. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Sleep is certainly one of those healers, and we should all be doing it as, as much as we can. You know, get that uh, seven, eight 
hours of sleep. I think that's really important. And uh, those were my 10 points uh, as far as lessons learned. And uh, are there any other takeaways? Anything that, that you personally, from watching the movie or just in your personal experience and working with a, a multi-generational uh, organization, can you share? Things that, that you have done, seen, or attempting to do that have changed the, the environment uh, and to you know basically make it make it more pleasant work and experience so any 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 thoughts please uh, take the minute to to share them Renee is saying a uh, younger generation wanted to minimize the contribution they thought they would get out of the older interns but then they were surprised and ended up learning from each other yeah that you said that before uh, and I mentioned that yeah what what can we learn uh, from the various generations so um, I've worked with with people from various different companies and organizations, uh, definitely different ages. Um, one one thing is for sure that uh, as the years go by, the the audiences seem to get younger for me. But uh, I'm 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 continuing to learn. I want to listen and learn from from other people, uh, especially the younger generation. And uh, the thing is about the the younger generation, and and this is more directed towards the millennials. You know, a lot of the uh, baby boomer generation and older generation, we're, we're not up on all of that technology. And I'm just going to say that, that does, that's not really a um, an excuse to make fun of or insult or uh, somehow demean a person because they're not using a certain technology. Uh, instead of uh, complaining or, or basically demeaning a person because they're not using a technology, you might want to offer a suggestion about, hey, you know what, this would actually be helpful in your job. Uh, why not uh, take a few minutes and I'll show you how to do it. Jules did that in the movie when uh, Robert De Niro as Ben Whitaker was working late uh, because he wouldn't leave until Jules left. And she saw him, so she came over with a couple of slices of pizza and looked and said, oh, I see you're on Facebook. That's great. And he said, yeah, about 10 minutes. And uh, she said, how's it going? And he said, well, you know, uh, I'll, I'll get it. I'll, I'm working on it. And she said, do you need any help? And then she helped him set up Facebook, and he was very appreciative of that. Uh, when he started his job, he really didn't know how to use that laptop very well and, and didn't know how to respond to email, and the two young folks on either side helped him out. So so uh, rather than look at uh, the uh, lack of use of a technology or the knowledge of technology, uh, as an as a, a a problem, turn around and find a way to help that person overcome their fear of the technology or what they need to know, and 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 show people. And of course, you're going to establish a great relationship uh, relationship by doing that. Okay, I have a couple of comments here. Um, let's see, uh, John Watson, your example of the technology coming out of the Dinero's briefcase. He and his desk partner had the same goals and core values just different ways of accomplishing it. Great choice on the movie and the wonderful examples it gives us. Yeah, I thought that was excellent, John. Okay, uh, Empathy for others when their daily actions don't align with your preconceived models. Be curious and open to a lifetime of learning from others. Yeah, let's do that. Lifetime of learning from others. Uh, great point on communication from John. Uh, the greatest myth is that it actually happened. Okay, we, we need to do a far better job of communicating, and we get back to that listening. It's really, really critical to listen, uh, not to interrupt people when they're speaking. Um, John Conti says, help others whenever possible. Yeah, John, why don't we put that on as a slogan, you know, at all project managers' desks, you know, help others whenever possible. Uh, so uh, anyway, those are my comments, and I, re I really appreciate all of the other comments offered by... Uh, the people on the call here. Um, I'm open to uh, having any of the attendees uh, take a few minutes and, and uh, offer a, something to talk about. Any uh, thoughts? Uh, if you're, I have your microphone available. If you raise your hand, I will connect you and you could make a comment. I kind of like to make these uh, webinars as, as interactive as possible. So uh, if you are interested in a comment or two before we close out, uh, now's the time to raise your hand. So anybody want to offer a suggestion, a comment, an observation, something else that we could take away from this session before we, we close out?
Okay, Chris Bart. Hey, Chris, how are you? Let me uh, see if I can get you off of mute here. There you go, Chris. How are you, Chris? So uh, what's on I'm your doing mind? I'm fine. Uh, two things. One is uh, I'm actually teaching all these two weeks and fortunately was able to get an exercise for the kids, the, the folks. Uh, so sorry about being late. Um, the thing that struck me is how meaty the movie is, how useful all of this is. It's a great structure. And whichever group one is a member of, the younger group or the older group, whichever it is, if we're interacting with other people around this, we need to talk from the perspective of the opposite group. So, uh, you know, we've got De Niro, we've got Anne Hathaway, we've got different people there. Um, we need to be expressing ourselves equally. And I think that would get us a lot of violence. We just lost your uh, audio, Chris. We just lost your audio. Very intriguing. Yeah, uh, Chris, we just lost a piece of your audio. Could you just repeat that? Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How much of that did you get? Uh, we, You were talking about a different perspective, and it was very rich and had a lot of information in it, and then uh, kind of got distorted. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've shut, up. I've shut off my Bluetooth. Sorry. Uh, what I think is really important uh, is this movie gets out on the tabletop. There's millennials, there's old folks, and of course there's everybody strewn in between. Um, in talking about it, it's okay to be a member of either of the two groups. That's no problem. And we can simply acknowledge it simply. But I think for me, if I'm working with this, it's going to be really important because I'm a member of the older group. Uh, to be again and again returning to the perspective of the other group, whichever the other group might be, and that I think it'll get the most uh, effect with whatever group I'm dealing with if I do that. That's my only comment. Thanks for bringing this up, Frank. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, uh, Chris and I uh, were co-speakers at a, uh, uh, a seminars at sea that was organized by the uh, Clearly Galveston PMI chapter uh, back in uh, the end of March and early April. Okay, um, any other comments? Anybody else want to offer a suggestion, uh, a, an observation about the movie, something that uh, we could take away as an, another uh, little bit of a nugget of information, something that we can pass on to other people? Okay, let's see, we have some, some questions here. Let's go to the questions. Um, Will you be sharing the PDU info? Yeah, uh, actually, I just put up the PDU info on the uh, slide. You should see that now. And uh, let's see who's got their hands up. It'll take me just a second to see if there's anybody else would like to contribute. Okay, it looks like we have uh, no other takers to uh, offer a... Uh, suggestion or some kind of a comment. So uh, I'd like to thank you all for, for joining the session. I hope you enjoyed it. Before you leave, uh, just put a post your comments about the session. Did you find it interesting, useful? You know, what can we do to make these kinds of webinars uh, even more effective in the future? I'm, I'm certainly uh, uh, open to those suggestions and uh, other topics that you'd like to hear. Uh, Jennifer says it will, uh, it's interesting. Okay, Cat Lee, I, the PDU information is, uh, is, is posted. Okay, as you leave the webinar, think about how you're going to do your, make your communications more effective, how you're going to spend more time listening, uh, that you're going to, how are you going to work with uh, your, the other generations to, to make sure that you have a meaningful experience all around. I think that uh, Chris mentioned in the um, movie there was, I think almost every generation was somehow touched and you could easily see uh, the contrast and the differences between the generations. So uh, let's focus more on uh, connecting generations instead of separating generations. I think that uh, that is really, really key. Uh, Teresa said intergenerational information is very helpful. Yeah, and, and you know, we, we don't have enough time in a webinar like this, but um, what I would suggest that everyone do, especially people in leadership positions, is to do a little bit of research on uh, the, the habits and, and behaviors 
of your typical uh, baby boomer and your generation X and Y and also millennials and I think that there's a new um, there's a new term for coming out for people who are uh, I think uh, under 17 you know between 13 and 17 I'm not really sure what that uh, uh, title is that they've given them but uh, one of the things that we do a pretty good job of is we keep titles and categories and uh, maybe you ought to stop thinking about the categories and focus on more on, on how we can actually work better together um, Roger says nice approach issue should an other generation learn how to work with me valued principle of the hippie boomer yeah you know that's a good point Roger you know I, I think that we need to make sure that people understand that baby boomer covers a very very broad range of people and 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 not everybody was in the corporate world there and and you know following administration so uh, let's not forget the value and the principles and the contributions of the hippie boomer we got to make sure we, we add that in there uh, John Watson says generational relationships should consider focusing more on our similarities and our differences yep I'm, I'm echoing that John for sure um, Linda Parsons says there were a lot of great points mentioned I work remote and I for one need to pick up the phone more and not reply on email <laughs> well Linda you know if you, if you want give me a call we'll just have a conversation um, anyway uh, a lot of uh, ageism in the marketplace yeah uh, yeah, we had we got to work on that. You know, let's 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 use the word respect. You know, I think respect is a word that's, that's not used enough. Teresa Knudsen, great session and good reminders on things we should do every day. It's important to appreciate the value of others in both our work and our social lives, regardless of age or other differences. Well, Teresa, I live in a very um, diverse environment, so I I, I understand that. And, uh, you know, I think that we probably, all of us, need to be a little bit more uh, sensitive. One of the things that I found, and this is just me, that on Facebook, uh, pe people spend more time saying very, very nasty and vulgar things when something happens or when they disagree. And um, I think that uh, we may be, we can certainly disagree. There's nothing wrong with that, you, you know, if you, don't, uh, if you don't, don't like what somebody's doing or something like that. But um, I think that maybe we should temper how we disagree and the words that we use and make sure that we get our points across. And I think Yale mentioned earlier about uh, emotional quotient and emotional intelligence. Let's be a little bit more aware of our behaviors and our own tone of voice when we speak to someone, and especially in, in times when we are in disagreement. Okay, um, Chris Bart says, Forbes says that uh, that generation is called Generation Z. And that's, okay, I'm, I'm good with that. And, and they are a, 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 in a generation that has been purely brought up on technology. Um, it's, that's kind of an interesting thing. I was at dinner the other night, and I watched uh, kind of an interesting situation. There were four dads taking out their kids, and they put the kids at one table, and all four kids had their uh, electronic devices, iPads and whatever, uh, focused on games and all kinds of things going on. And the dad sat at another table and they were talking about sports and other stuff I can't remember. But a complete separation, total separation. The only time the dads actually went over to the table was to uh, make sure that uh, the right food had been uh, put in front of them. So uh, let's... Uh, this is that concerns me that the art of dialogue seems to be going away, especially in the family. Uh, take the time to have a discussion once in a while. Uh, Jennifer says they're called <laughs> Z zombies. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, so um, how can we reduce the impact on job hunting about ageism? Well, um, I don't have a specific or clear answer for that. Uh, that's actually a, a, a something for a good long discussion on. But um, I think that, you would, again, you have to go in there. Uh, the resume is not the key anymore as far as I know when it comes to interviews. It's what you do. It's what your attitude is, how you are prepared to answer questions. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, if you can show where you can pr produce value and if they don't ask you the right questions, then you should be saying, well, why didn't you ask me this question? Or, hey, let me give you a couple of thoughts about, you know, my approach on things and, and, and show extreme confidence. Okay, a lot of people will look at someone that's in their 60s and say, no, nope, I'm not going to hire them just because, uh, which is, as far as I know, against the law anyway. 
but um, be confident. Be aware of your appearance. Uh, get up to date on news. Get up to date on social events. Uh, make sure that you have at least some knowledge of uh, the social media that's being used and the technology that's out there. And then just show them what you're worth. I mean, those are the kinds of things that I think are important. But uh, to me, walking in there with extreme confidence and uh, explaining people and, and, and showing through not only body language, but the choice of words that you use when you're speaking are going to make a difference. So those are just my initial thoughts on that. Okay, so uh, I thank you all for, for being here. I appreciate it. And there uh, will be other webinars coming up. And uh, I did send out a note oh, about a, two weeks ago. I'm looking for speakers for webinars and also for International Project Management Day events. And those of you that responded, if you're on here, I, I will be getting more information out on that uh, within uh, the next uh, day or two, no later than tomorrow, actually. So uh, we'll, s we'll see you again on the next webinar. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, take care and good luck. Uh, Jennifer? Um, my email, I think my email is on the uh, slides here. Let me take a look if you want to get in touch with me. Okay. Let's see if it's on there. It's not on there. Okay, my email is salatuspmp at msn.com. Uh, salatuspmp at msn.com. If you uh, want to get in touch with me, certainly talk about speaking opportunities and things like that, certainly do so. Uh, and... Uh, this is the information that I pulled off of the PMI screen for the PDU claim. This is a, a Category B PDU in the triangle. It's leadership, leadership in the talent triangle. So I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, feel free to send me comments and email. Post them on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. I'm also on LinkedIn and on Twitter. And uh, I'd certainly like to hear from you. So with that, I thank you very much. Let's see, another question popped up here. Better listening. How do you listen to a text? Uh, communications is a recurring theme and has always been a biggest challenge. Great job. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> that's John Watson. Um, yeah, you can't really listen to a text. I, I tell you one thing, they are convenient. Like, don't get me wrong, that we, we have to use this technology. I mean, I use texting every day. We text to my family and friends about stuff that we need to get stuff out real quick. But, you know, uh, when it gets to be a, a long discussion, you know what? It's time for the phone call. So let's do that. Let's uh, learn some balance in our communication and uh, certainly um, share, share your knowledge. Be willing to become a mentor. And uh, don't forget that book, the uh, Dealing with People You Can't Stand. There. You're going to find some very, very useful information in there. The title of the book is may be somewhat misleading, but you're going to find some great information about how to work better with people. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining and look for the next webinar. And again, my contact is salatuspmp at msn.com. Don't forget, forget uh, November 2nd, 2017, International Project Management Day. And uh, you can maybe on that day say thank you to a project manager, to a project team, because uh, I always leave with this quote, the value of project management can be seen in any skyline. If we didn't have project managers, we wouldn't have skylines. Just about everything that we do every day, all the things that we use as a result of a project manager and a project team. So with that, thank you very much. We in touch real soon. Take care.